Shaw Icon slot layout just taken by David Dow. And the discussion will be at 4 o'clock at let's say 5 to 7. We will get on at 7 o'clock the IFR bus. So if you we come at 7 3, you won't be on the bus. Okay. Um, now we have these
chain of barrels. And then we have rho squared is defined as r hat squared plus m squared plus m squared a. Now, some basic properties of this is that the surface gravity or equivalent of walking temperature vanishes. That's not true as soon as it's extreme. And, however, there is another thermodynamic potential, the angular velocity of the horizon, and um, that's equal to 1 over twice times the mass. And really, we should think of this, where we're going here is we're going to have a, a CFT, a two-dimensional component field theory, that lives in the T hat or the T phi on the T phi cylinder. And roughly speaking, uh, there's a but there's left movers and right movers that spiral two ways around the cylinder, and this is a temperature for the left move, going to be a temperature for the right movers, and this is going to be a temperature uh, for the left movers. And uh, finally, there's Beckenstein Hawking entropy, which is the area of the point of area of bend horizon, which is given just by the simple formula 2 pi times. Momentum, which is, uh, I normalize the angular momentum here so that the coming out has J equals a half. Um, but of course, the black hole has JRS 1915 has J equals a 10 to the 7. Okay, that's the Kerr metric, uh, like in the white liner. Um, any questions? Okay, 
So this is just a coordinate transformation. We do this coordinate transformation, and then the new metric will have a lambda in it. It's a solution for any value of lambda. Uh, and if we take lambda all the way to zero, we'll find that this simplifies. And what does it simplify to? It simplifies to, so,
So that's because the field strength is SL2R and very SL2R. I mean, you can write down the generators and check it. There's also a U1 uh, symmetry. Uh, so it's SL. The, the isometry group is actually SL2R or SL21 times U1. And, uh, okay. So, now, if we go to the point where lambda squared is 1, then this is, uh, so when lambda squared equals 1, and we freeze that up, we just have the S squared is equal to uh, constant times minus R squared to T squared plus the R squared over R squared plus D5 plus R T squared. So, This some of you may recognize as the metric if phi is not identified, is this is the met actually the metric on the AD, on ADS3. So there's for a specific polar and fixed polar angle, there's actually an ADS3 submanifold of of uh, the neurotic curve. So we're always talking about ADS and we actually you know, can see this up there in the sky. There's a region of the sky where uh, there's at least, of course, it's four, the real world is four dimensional, but there's a, a simple sub manifold of, of, uh, of the black holes that we're looking at where you actually have an ADS3. And so we would expect that all the ideas that we uh, developed in, in AD, from in ADS CFD uh, should should somehow go <coughs> through here. And uh, uh, and that's the case. Now, actually, I should mention the first calculation I did was a very simple one. I just kind of did a dimensional reduction on the theta. And then I had an ADS3, and then I could use the standard formula for the second chart. And um, that gave me the right answer numerically for for uh, entropy, but it's a little too simple. I, I, I can't be justified. So, so what I'm going to do in the beginning of this is it's going to be a rather elaborate, careful justification that you can get the right answer to the introduction. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the three things you did was given. The first one was focusing on the horizon. The second, the key thing was the redshift. Was that phi formula the fact that we have moved the speed of light near the, near the horizon? Uh, yeah, that, that, that I believe that's right. So, so that uh, right. So that uh, if you fix phi rather than phi hat, you're moving along the null generator of the horizon. Okay. So now, what's, what's the last question? Uh, what's the question? Uh, can be greater than one. It can be greater than one. Yeah, but it is true in curve inside the Earth sphere. That's exactly where that is. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, and, you know, in some, we can't just blindly apply everything we've learned in string theory because there really are some, some differences here. And, and uh, if you look at, if you go on to the boundary of the space, which is, which is what we're trying which is what we can do, we might try to understand the asymptotics of the space. Uh, the nature of the boundary, you can go through the time lines of the space like that. about working with Kerr is we know that we're talking about a system that has to make physical sense. You know, we start analyzing vertical black holes and so on and so forth. Those don't have to, in the end, we don't have to be able to make sense of it. They may just be sick as physical systems. But Kerr cannot be sick as a physical system. Um, and in fact, we got to this point, and then we started working on 3D gravity and vertical black holes <laughs> and that had other, that whole subject, while in a way mathematically simpler, was more complicated by the fact that you don't know whether you're talking about something that the system that makes sense. But here, here, it's the real world, so we're guaranteed that it has to make sense. Um, okay, so uh, if we take this connect geometry, and we take slices of fixed beta. These are, for lattice 4 equals 1, uh, these are ABS3. For other values of lattice squared, uh, you don't get exactly ABS3. You get a space called warped ABS3. And it bears the same relation to ABS3 that the squashed 3 sphere bears to S3. And again, has similar properties and seems likely to be the in this area. So. Okay. So, um, okay. But just for an analogy to AS3 and more good AS3 is good enough, uh, we should be able to uh, uh, analyze this on its own right. In other words, what we want to do. And so by now, you know, since the ABM, which was, I don't know, it was the 50s or the 60s, you know, there's now a half a century of discussion about how you impose uh, boundary conditions and the, the general relativity and space time for various different kinds of asymptotics. And um, <coughs> many examples have been worked out. And so it's a, a systematic uh, question. And an important concept in this um, is that now we just want to apply that machinery to this problem, to this, uh, this geometry, which I guess I didn't say that, but of course, this geometry is no longer an asymptotic reflect. We threw away the asymptotic flat each. It's got some funny, uh, uh, you know, if we draw a picture of the curve like, oh, you know, here somewhere, we zoomed in on this region here, and we throughout the asymptotic flat So now we have to, to understand, first, just how to define classical general relativity in this space with different asymptotics. <laughs> now, an important concept in, in uh, this discussion is something called the asymptotic symmetry. Short of that. 
In a quantum theory, we would demand that the trivial diffeomorphisms <laughs> annihilate states. But the non-trivial diffeomorphisms don't have to annihilate states. But the states have to fall to representations of, of the non-trivial yeah, I guess I need to that also. So, sorry, just to clarify, when you mentioned the asymptotic symmetry group, you have uh, in mind the full and null infinity uh, when that is admitted in those cases? Or? Well, um, I mean, the asymptotic symmetry group at null and you have to say where your symmetry of what. So uh, for, for null infinity, uh, this is, I believe this is the DNS group. Uh, Some, 
some good progress has been made, but there wasn't. The first thing to do is to try to uh, study uh, the simpler problems. So we started out by uh, demanding that m squared equals j, or e, we can call this e, equals 0. <coughs> And then we spent a, a very long time trying to find a solution to this problem. And uh, we, 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 we found a solution, only one solution. There are many things you have to check. It's, it's, it's <laughs> infinitely many possible generators of the charge. Uh, to date, no one has found any other solution uh, of this problem. Um, but there's no proof that the solution that we the other solution to the problem that includes the e equals zero piece. Um, and, and so what does it look like? Well, um, we write uh, a fluctuation of the metric HAB, and we take uh, something like H. Phi phi goes like a quarter of one at infinity. H phi theta goes like a quarter of one over R. Uh, H phi H R R goes like a quarter of one over R cube, etc. I won't write them down. And oh, I won't write them all down there in our paper. We found some set of boundary conditions. E is in square by the state plus E. E is uh, m squared minus j. Yeah. And more specifically, it's um, it's 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 d by dt. And why is d by dt m squared minus j rather than m? It's because of the answer to Shiraz's question. This t, if you move along this t but keep all the fonts fixed, you're moving along the null generators of the horizon, and that, that is that is measuring the fonts here. The real the conditions allow j and m to change while you maintain the Okay, so um, now we have zeta. Equal to minus r. So now we can write down the most general isomorphism, which satisfies these boundary conditions. And what we find is that zeta is equal to minus r epsilon <coughs> prime of phi. I'm sorry, what's your question? 
suppose that the square minus j is not square. Yeah. Uh, you can still admit these as a total boundary. If m squared minus j is not zero, these generators are not well defined. They have divergences. Okay. So now these zetas obey a Lie bracket algebra. They're diffeomorphisms. So, so far, everything's classical. So, and their their Lie bracket algebra. Is um, I zeta m zeta m is equal to m minus m zeta m plus m. In other words, it's a centerless Virasaro Okay. Now we need to talk about the charges. Um, so there are some very uh, long and detailed papers about performance for charges. <coughs> and there's some very interesting <coughs> long papers, but there are really some interesting facts in them. And the first thing is that in general, it's too much to ask for an absolute definition of, of conserved charges. In general, you may only understand you may only have a finite expression for the infinitesimal difference between the two charges, the charges of neighboring field configuration. And then to get relative charges, you have to integrate along some path. And um, if you integrate along this, then you have to show that you have a flat connection. In other words, there's an integrability condition that has to be satisfied to show that the charges are independent of the path. Now, because charges are only defined in this way, this isn't going to come in to anything I'm going to say, but I'm mentioning it because I think it's very interesting and there's some interesting things in it. It can turn out that the charges are nonlinear in the um, asymptotic, in the strength in the asymptotic field space. And indeed, the people who worked out this formalism looked at the girdle, the girdle black holes and they were able to compute all this. These purple black holes have some rather reminiscent structural <laughs> aspects. And indeed, they found that the charges, you know, we're used to all charges always being linear in the field strength. But there can be well defined kind of conserved charges when we have more subtle asymptotics that, um, that are not linear. And I suspect that this is going to come up in. Curve in the, in the next country that we understand. Okay, but anyway, this is given by 1 over 8 pi, the integral over the boundary of the slice of k zeta, which depends on h and a background metric g bar. And k zeta of h and g bar. It has a long expression with terms like uh, epsilon, alpha, beta, mu, nu. It's a two form because we're integrating over the boundary of a three manifold, which is a two surface. Epsilon, alpha, beta, mu, nu, zeta, nu. So it involves the diffeomorphism. It's linear in the diffeomorphism, and it's linear in the perturbation. H, and then there's like six more terms, dx alpha plus dx beta, plus one, two, three, four, <coughs> plus six terms. Basically everything allowed by the symmetries. Uh, it's a complicated expression, but there's a lot of information. This is the change in the charge of two things which differ by uh, g bar, which if you go from g bar to g bar plus h, the charge changes by this number. So to linear order, this is just q. And I'm only going to, everything I'm going to do is just going to be linear order. And this is this is like the two thirds infinity. But in that, it's going to be uh, three dimensional. 
in the four dimensions, we live in four space time dimensions, and we've got a three dimensional spatial spots, and so it's always going to be a two square of this In fact, in higher dimensions, this formalism hasn't really been. Um, okay, now, so these are the charges that generate the dimorphisms. They are direct bracket algebra has to equal the lead bracket algebra of the dimorphisms they generate up to the central term. And the central term is basically uh, so there's a point where it looks like this. So let's define Q of data N, M, and take its direct bracket with Q of data N. That must be, I mean, the, the formalism guarantees it. Uh, Greg's formalism, uh, of course, guaranteed it, but this is a, a serious uh, refinement of Greg's formalism must be n minus n q of zeta n plus m plus the central term. And beautifully, there's an explicit formula for the central term. It's 1 over 8 pi, the integral of zeta, k of zeta n. So to take this and put it to zeta m, and then you take H. So if we, if we were to, this were to be zeta n, and now we could vary it with respect to zeta m, that would act on this H. And so it's the zeta m on the background metric G bar, G bar. Okay, now, amazingly, this is the number. It doesn't depend on, if all the integrating conditions are satisfied, so it doesn't depend on. Uh, I think it's automatically an estimate. Yeah, it's automatically an estimate. Um, and uh, so, so now we have a number, and uh, we find that this is all equal to m cubed minus m over 12 <laughs> times uh, 12j. So, we identify this as the central charge. It's just a lot of the definition of the charge that we got. Yes. That's it. Uh, to compute this number, you plug the background metric in the G-bar. You plug in the background metric in the G-bar. This, this guy up here, the next channel up here. And I didn't quite get what you said about this non-linear business. It's not relevant here, okay. because we're not going to we're not going to now learn, but but I feel it's an interesting and underappreciated fact. So I'm just throwing it out there. Is that an exact and for central value somehow not linear? Should we should we think of this as the algebra of a small amplitude only? Or is this exact? Change 
charge to get that uh, formula that S is equal to uh, 2 pi, because the entropy is equal to 2 pi j. And uh, so we want to use the Cardi formula, which says that the entropy is equal to pi squared c over 3 times the temperature. But uh, the temperature, the Hawking temperature of a curved black hole is, is not, um, is conjugate to the energy. And we're not talking about uh, the energy here, we're talking about the momentum. So we want to understand what the, uh, what the energy, what the temperature is, is conjugate to the, uh, this conjugate to the angular momentum. And uh, since um, we're running out of time, let me just tell you. So this is some standard thing in, in, in black hole dynamics. Uh, it was really worked out in the 70s. And you find that the, the we were calling this C left. And we're calling this T left. So, um, so C left. Is uh, so C left is equal to 12J, and the temperature, which is conjugate to uh, this, is uh, T left is equal to 1 over 3 pi. Now, another way to see this temperature is uh, for those of you familiar with ADS3, is that um, you know that if you take a quotient of ADS3 with respect to uh, that lies purely in one SL2R subgroup, um, that, that that's dual to something at a finite T left and zero T right. And indeed, we saw that our cross sections of uh, fixed angle were not precisely, were not precisely A to or B to A to They were quotients, they were quotients as well. And so now, if you uh, assume the Cardi formula, you find that um, that uh, S black hole is equal to pi squared times 12j times 3 times 2 pi, which is equal to 2 pi j which is a formula that will appear after I wrote down in the beginning. Uh, it, it, it will appear if I move the right one up a little bit. So this um, corroborates the uh, suggests that we, we did our, 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 our calculation correctly, though uh, there's, there's more to be uh, understood. Let me just say, I'm out of time here, but let me just say a few words about uh, the assumption of the Cardi formula. So there are several things that go into uh, the, Cardi, the Cardi formula, several conditions for validity. One is that it should be unitary. And here, uh, I again, we, we've only talked very generally use general properties of diffeomorphism invariance. But I I would hope that since we're talking about the world, that in some sense or, or other the, uh, the the theory should be unitary. Uh, but what about the uh, second condition that uh, L naught is much greater than C? Uh, well I didn't write down L naught or what the temperature but we can see that, uh, I, I guess you also need probably the temperature much greater than C, which is very much not the case here, because C is the one. What? It's just T much greater than one? Yeah, that doesn't pay for the number of species. We just look up the OK, so it's T much greater than one. And that's not the case here, it's one over two times. So actually, this happened uh, uh, in, in, the, in the stringy examples. And uh, we understood that the original stringy examples, the carbon formula was not in the original applicability, it never was work. And we 
eventually understood why it worked there. And the same reasoning uh, works here. The Cardi formula, this is a sufficient but not a necessary condition for equilibrium Cardi formula. The Cardi formula really works, it's a statistical formula, and it works when you're exciting many, many degrees of freedom. And, um, and that can happen at small temperatures if you have a very small gap, in theory, with a very small gap. And we now know that all the stringy examples, there is a very small gap. But we also know here that there's a very small gap, thanks to a paper that uh, Xander wrote when he was a baby. And, and uh, how do we know that there's a small gap here? The argument that there's a small gap here, a beautiful argument, an appreciated argument, which doesn't involve string theory in any way. The reasoning is as follows. Let's, um, so we can compute, uh, so let's think about a, little, uh, a, a, a black hole that's very near uh, externality. And let's imagine there's some gap of states. And now we compute the Hawking radiation. Uh, now, the Hawking radiation assumes that there's infinitely many states in the thermodynamic calculation. And uh, therefore, uh, it, it, there can't be too big a gap. If there were a big gap, uh, um, then once you get, so suppose, here's another way to say it. Suppose there, there's some gap, e gap, in the real quantum theory. The Hawking calculation is continuing that. Then the Hawking calculation would have to break down when you're only really that far above externality. But the Hawking calculation is self consistent. So you have to be able to see when the Hawking calculation is going to break down. And we know that the Hawking calculation is going to break down when the typical energy. So the, 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 the semi-classical calculation predicts its own demise. And it's when you know that you're wrong and ignoring back reaction. So you know that you're wrong and ignoring back reaction. when the energy of a typical Hawking quantum is the order of the game. So that gives us an estimate of how big the gap should be. This estimate matched perfectly in all the screening examples. Um, and that's why we have this small gaps in screen theory. And we can also uh, <coughs> compute it, uh, the gap for her. And we find that the gap in L mod is going like uh, precisely like one over J, one over the same charge. And under these conditions, <laughs> Do indeed expect the, the uh, current contract. So let me stop. Uh, let me stop there.
So somehow you can learn about SUM, the SUM gauge theory somehow knows about SUM gauge uh, theory. Let me say one, one other comment along, 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 along these lines, which is something I think it will, will turn out to be true, but I, don't, I can't. It's a speculation. What happens in string theory? In string theory, we have this one must see a 61 key. And then we have these twisted sectors. And so this equal 6 q one q 5 there is really the symmetric product to the Q1, Q5 of a, a basic C equal 6 there. And I don't know if it had to work out this way, but all the way that this you know, there's this whole story that the second quantized Hilbert space of a particle in ADS is like the first quantized Hilbert space of this conformal field theory. And that's possible because this is a symmetric product conformal field theory. And so what I would hope, I think that, and so much of the match between the uh, microscopic and macroscopic pictures dependent on the symmetric product structure in the stringy examples. I'm speculating, I don't have any way to derive it now, I'm speculating that something similar should be true in curve. In other words, that we have a basic C equals 6 or C equals 12 theory. And then we take a J-fold symmetric product of it. And, uh, and, and, and the uh, uh, <coughs> now we take the J-fold symmetric product on it and the, um, and the black holes in an excited state and the J-fold symmetric product. If that were the case, then, well, then I think that, I, I can't show that that's the case, but I think the things that were bothered you would stop bothering them. If uh, that were the case, but the fact that they bothered you is not enough for you to conclude that it's not the case. More questions? <clears throat> oh, is your argument to generate another set of application for a charge level? A charge level? It's been done. Uh, there are a number of papers on this adding all kinds of charges, higher dimensions, adding a cosmological constant. And in those contexts, the match between the entropy, so I think it's been done in arbitrary dimensions with cosmological constants and arbitrary set of charges. And in that context, um, uh, the match between the entropy and the central charge in the Carter formula much more non-trivial. It's a function, a non-polynomial function of, of, uh, of, of a bunch of variables. But in every case, it always works itself. Yeah.
The other thing about uh, things violating uh, the small structures could go out and violate the boundary conditions. Um, I'm not sure exactly what. They never said anything exactly about that. They said something about something that was close to that and then thought it would also be true for that. But um, we do, if it, if it is true, if there is something like that, there's also, an, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow, there's a, a difference here than, in, 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 from a, a, an important difference from uh, the ADS3 case, in that there's some, there is some kind of instability. And we want there to be an instability. We know that the curved black hole at externality is, is unstable. And um, due to the Bruce Darvinsky radiation, we get sort of air production. Uh, it's a close variation of the argument. And that we weren't able to um, also find. Uh, and when I talk about the super A, we were able to match that macroscopic instability with the microscopic instability. In other words, the modes that uh, are responsible for the Stravinsky radiation um, are, uh, are dual to uh, conformal uh, operators with imaginary conformal dimension and therefore related to some And what, how we should think about, uh, we've, we've gotten some precise match in that we were able to kind of match the correlation functions. But exactly how we're supposed to think about that was in a different language where you don't have boundary conditions. And how, exactly how you're supposed to think about boundary conditions for modes like that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. These are the kinds of models that other people were, were, were discussing. So the sort of like that. In this CFT, there are operators with Uh, 
Yes, we don't know. The question is why would the car be for the why would the car for the road? I'm not. You know, it's not like a string theory where we start with something we completely understand and then we're going to rely on the thought. 